I'm reading from Matthew 5, 13 to 16, and chapter 6, 1 to 6, and 16 to 18. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites, for they mark their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may not be seen, may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The word of the Lord. We used to have a swear jar at home. I set this up as an arrangement with the boys. Every time mommy swore, she'd have to put a quarter in the jar. It was not funny. (laughs) She had a problem and she was trying to stop. So the kids were innocent and now we're all adults and sometimes the talk in our house is a little too salty, even for my taste. The Cambridge Dictionary defines salty in four ways. Number one, tasting of salt or containing a lot of salt. Number two, annoyed or upset, especially when this is unreasonable. Number three is my favorite, critical in a slightly funny way. And number four, not polite and using swear words. So they're all pretty negative, except for the first one, of course, because bacon We're obviously going for the first definition tonight as a metaphor. You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. The you here is plural. You are the light of, uh, sorry, you Jesus people are salt. You make things better. You Jesus people are light. You brighten things up. So better and brighter for whom, you might ask, for our own little community, I don't think so. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So this is our third teaching time in our series on the good life, lessons from the Sermon on the Mount. And the part of Jesus' teaching we're looking at tonight includes the Lord's Prayer, but because we spent all of summer looking at the Lord's Prayer, we're not going to address that part tonight. We'll start with, you are the salt of the earth. So we tend to think of the salt of the earth as people who are especially kind and good. And I heard it just this last week on a CBC radio interview with Chantal Kraviatsik, who said that Manitobans have a salt of the earthness about, about us. And for her, that meant a certain simplicity, a certain lack of pretension. But I don't know. I feel like that makes the phrase about status, we're so good and less about function, and I think that Jesus is getting at function. 
in this passage. So if we've heard the phrase salt of the earth so often that it's lost its meaning, one scholar suggests and might help to think of a different spice or seasoning to understand Jesus' point. You are the nutmeg. <laughs> I, that was a bad example because I honestly think nutmeg ruins everything. <laughs> you are the cilantro. Same like some people love it, some people hate it. Is there a spice that is universally appreciated? You are the red hot chili pepper. I don't know. I think it's you are the cinnamon of the earth. So Joe brought snack tonight and put cinnamon in it because she knew where I was going with this. Awesome. I think that's the better one. But let's get back to salt. Salt is an active agent. It does something. It brings out the flavor. Jewish scholar Amy Jill Levine, whose book, I'm re- it's just a little book, but I'm relying quite heavily on it tonight. It's called Sermon on the Mount, A Beginner's Guide to the Kingdom of Heaven. And it's just fabulous. I've been using it for this series and others who preach in this series. I hope you come find me and use this as well if you'd like. Uh, She teases out the salt metaphor, saying salt is a preservative, it's a seasoning, it's useful, and it's even valuable. In the ancient world, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. And did you know that the word salt comes from the Latin word cell, which is the origin of the English word salary? Levine notes that salt is a simple element, and it's intended to enhance something else. So Jesus' followers as salt of the earth bring out the goodness that is already there in God's good earth. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And we tend to use light of the world only to refer to Jesus because of scripture verses like 1 John 1 verse 5. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And Jesus' own words about himself, I am the light of the world. But here, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls his disciples the light of the world. And I think that is incredible. What a confidence boost. Light dispels the darkness. Light is the beacon of safety for the ship in the storm. Nothing grows or even lives without light. Amy Jill Levine writes, Once the disciples recognize that they are light, they also recognize that their role is to shine so that others can find their way, to become like that city on a hill, a refuge, a home. Imagine the church as a refuge, as a home. Unfortunately for many people, the church has not been a refuge. And if we participated in any learning opportunities last weekend, we will have been reminded of the historic abuses of the church. The church was the oppressor, a weapon of assimilation. The church caused great harm and still does, particularly when we're more about power than presence and when when we respond to injustice with silence. But Jesus says, be visible. Let your light shine. May your love be so bright that it draws people out of the storm to the haven of safety that is the people of God, a community of healing and peace, beauty and love, wholeness and well-being. Shine, people, shine. That's a reference to... Do you know the reference? Okay. Shine, Jesus, shine, 90s chorus. Wouldn't it be fun to sing shine, people, shine to each other? No? That song never needs to come back? Okay. Josh has to do some deep breathing here in the front here. (laughs) But then a little later in the sermon, Jesus cautions, don't parade your goodness, your piety, for others to see. When you give, when you pray, when you fast, be quiet about it. So what is going on here? Is Jesus speaking out of both sides of his mouth? Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and beware of practicing your righteousness before others. So what, which is it? Well, as in any kind of learning, it's helpful to read to the end of the sentence. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let your light shine so God's reputation is restored. God is good. God is love. God is beautiful. 
Let your light shine so the world sees that that is true. And beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. In order to be seen. Vanity projects are very easy to spot. They give us that icky feeling. Like the name on the building is more important than the good happening inside. Vanity projects are annoying to the outsider and after a while exhausting for the person at the center because the glitz and the glamour eventually fade and take effort to maintain. Again, Amy Jill Levine says something helpful. She says, salt does its work by not calling attention to itself, but by brightening, by making more alive everything it permeates. And just as too much salt can kill, too much light can blind. Effective light does not call attention to itself. Rather, it lights up the world. Salt and light are only functional because of their interaction with something other than themselves. So we salt our eggs to make the eggs taste better. It's about the eggs, not the salt. And we turn on a light to see what's in the room, not to see the light itself. There's a big difference between letting our light shine so we look good and letting our light shine so God looks good. I think God only has a bad rap because God hasn't been well represented by humans on earth. We can't tell people God is love, God is patient, God is kind, God keeps no record of wrongs, and at the same time tell them that God will be disappointed in them if they don't believe exactly these things, say exactly this prayer, and live exactly this way. It's no wonder to me why many people choose to reject the very idea of God. I remember substitute teaching at a Christian elementary school and being on recess duty when a conflict broke out between a few of the boys. And I can't remember the details, but it was a big enough deal that I felt the need to bring one of the boys to another teacher who knew the group better than I did. So that was probably a mistake on my part because I have a clear memory of the teacher's stern face as she towered over the kid and said something along the lines of, what do you think Jesus would say about your behavior? And the boy shrank into himself, silent. And so now I'm going to take that same boy to Bible class and tell him God is love? I can imagine a better scenario. I can imagine that teacher, and maybe it should have been me, crouching down, pulling up a chair, and asking, what happened? What got you so mad? And is there anything we can do to make it better? Had the teacher, or had I, talked to the boy with an awareness of his having been made in the image of God, and with the goal of bringing out the good that was already in him, like salt bringing out the flavor of the eggs, things could have gone so much better. We need to keep reminding each other that we are salt. Remember the you is plural. You, people of God, are the salt of the earth. You are not the sulfuric acid, the corrosive element that breaks things down, just in case you didn't know. So all together now, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And again, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so when we get to the part about spiritual disciplines, whenever you give, whenever you pray, whenever you fast, the you is singular, which is not all that surprising to me since individuals tend to be tempted to vanity perhaps more than communities. Giving, praying, and fasting are assumed. Jesus is speaking to his disciples who are Jews, and these things are already part of their practice. So Jesus isn't saying what to do, but how to do it. His focus is on posture and attitude and motivation. Give, pray, and fast without thinking about how these things make you look good. Give because you love, pray because you love, fast because you love. Love expands our gaze to others and to God. Vanity, on the other hand, shrinks our gaze, the focus is ourself. Vanity's root is insecurity. So when we give, when we pray, and we fast to look good, we're insecure. But what reason do we have to be insecure? Remember the Beatitudes that we learned a couple weeks ago and we sung about tonight. Jesus says you are blessed 
you who are poor in spirit, you who mourn, you who are meek. And tonight we learn that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's how I think of you, Jesus says. I think you're the bee's knees in the cat's pajamas. So who cares what anyone else thinks? But more than a motivational speech, Jesus is presenting an alternate model of community. In Greco-Roman society, the person who would give the most away had the most power. Public displays of generosity improved a person's status and reputation. So in contrast, the disciples of Jesus were to quietly provide for each other's needs. Prayer and fasting were meant to be communication with God, not performance in some public arena. In Jesus' view, hypocrites were people playing a part, not living authentically. And again, it's about motivation. It's about what's in the heart. Is it love or is it self-interest? After our Truth and Reconciliation gathering last Saturday, John and I, my husband John and I, went out to eat, still wearing our orange t-shirts. No one else in the restaurant was wearing them, and I felt conspicuous. I did not like the attention. I was fighting with thoughts like, look at us being so good, and I need to go home and change right now. I put on my orange shirt again on Monday and went to the powwow at the convention center, and this time I blended in, of course. There was a sea of orange. But I was still very aware of my whiteness. And sometimes I wonder if white woman in orange shirt is experienced as love or as vanity. We are human. We've got mixed motives at the best of times. I want you to think this is a good teaching time. That is the vanity in me. But I also want to point us to something transcendent, and that's the love. I know the difference because one is anxiety producing and one is freeing. One closes me in on myself, and one opens me up. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is nuanced. He assumes the intelligence and the sensitivity of his listeners, and I think he trusts that they're going to get the difference between being salty and being showy. And I think the questions to ask ourselves as individuals are these. Are my actions experienced by others as love? Or are my actions experienced by others as vanity and pretense? And I think the question to ask ourselves as a community is this. Does the way we live our faith make the world a better or a worse place? In the church of my childhood and youth, we talked a lot about making a difference. And today we're a bit shy about that kind of talk. But Levine writes, any faith that does not manifest itself in works is not faith. It's complacency and self-satisfaction. It is not salt because it contributes nothing to the earth. It is not light since its shining is only for self-reflection. So we probably need to be a bit more brave, a bit more bold. We need to recover our passion for making a difference so that when people engage with us, they experience the goodness of God. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. These are statements of fact, like the Beatitudes. They're how Jesus sees you. So be salty and be bright. Amen. <laughs>